Well, good morning and welcome back to our Sunday School class and thank you so very much for coming. We definitely appreciate it. Uh, thank you so very much for your continued support and feedback of this experimental model of running Sunday School class where I'm pre-recording the sessions. I heard some feedback from last time that um, people in the Sunday School class would generally speaking just like to hear me lecture for anywhere from 30 to 35 minutes. Um, in which case, that's not a problem. I'd be happy to lecture uh, for, uh, you know, the next half hour or 40 minutes for us and then let you have some time after that to discuss. So any question that I'm asking will merely be rhetorical or questions that you can just simply think about and then we'll go on from there. Just do want to remind us at this time, just an announcement or two, um, please remember that on Easter Sunday, which is about two weeks from now, there will be no Sunday school. Instead, we'll have a sunrise service at 9 o'clock and then Easter breakfast together as kind of a potluck sort of thing at 930 and then at 1030 we'll worship for Resurrection Sunday morning. So just wanted to kind of pop that in our minds and, and let us know what's coming and what's ahead. Also did want to make us aware that um, not this week, but the following week, we will be having um, our Monday Thursday service here at South Union at 6 p.m. And then on Good Friday, there's a community service at Oak Grove Mennonite Church at 6.30 p.m. for our Good Friday service. And so um, Holy Week is going to be a bit packed there with services, but I did want to let, just let us know as a way of announcement that that was going to be some of the things that are coming up. At this time, then, I still do want us to begin our Sunday School class with a time of sharing and a time of prayer. So if you wouldn't mind, please go ahead and um, begin to share uh, your prayer requests and then have a few people um, pray over each other and pray for the Sunday School class and the Sunday service upstairs. That would be wonderful. Thank you so much. All right, thank you so very much for praying. I definitely appreciate it. Let's then go ahead and also start off with a psalm um, for this week. Why don't we read together or have one person read out loud Psalm 64, verses 1 through 10. Psalm 64, verses 1 through 10. And let's let that be our opening. So again, if we could pause the video at this time and we'll have someone read Psalm 64, verses 1 through 10. Thank you so much. If you would please open up your Bibles to Daniel chapter 9. We're going to be entering into um, Daniel chapter 9 this morning. This may take one or two or three sessions. I'm not quite sure. It depends on if I make any bunny trails here or not into any interesting things that we see. Um, but we're going to be in Daniel 10. Now, Daniel chapter, I'm, I'm sorry, not Daniel 10, Daniel chapter 9, as you see in the screen in front of you, this is where we're going to be. And the overarching thing is you, we're going to see this gorgeous, beautiful, theologically rich prayer from Daniel. And then we're going to be able to see the response that Daniel receives. And there are some very interesting things in the response um, and in what Gabriel gives to Daniel. And then we'll, we'll wrap up with an interpretation of, of that material at the end of Daniel. And so when we're thinking about Daniel chapter 9, those are the key elements. We're going to have a setting, for just very briefly. Then we'll have our prayer and that's going to be really theologically rich and dense. And then we'll have the material or the answer that Gabriel gives to Daniel, as well as um, some other interpretation there, both of how this would play out historically and how it will play out in the future. 
So that's where Daniel chapter 9 is going. Let's simply start out, if we could have one person please read for us, Daniel chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. So if we could have pause the video, have one person read Daniel chapter 9, verses 1 and 2 for us, that would be wonderful. Thank you so much. Alrighty, thank you so very much. And so here again, um, we're just going to be seeing some things and observing the text, pulling out some rich things that we have. It says, in the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, um, Ahasuerus, I'm sorry, let me look at the Hebrew here. I know I was going to botch that word. Let me try to enlarge that for us to see. Um, here we have uh, the word in Hebrew. Um, there it is in English. I have honestly, I have no idea how to pronounce this in English. I know that's embarrassing. This is Acha 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 Shverosh. All right, and so that's the word. I'm not sure why they didn't just use the 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 nicer word here. As you can see, it also means Xerxes, um, which is much easier to pronounce in English, or at least I'm much I'm more familiar with it. Um, but there's the Hebrew for that word, and it's actually easier to pronounce in Hebrew than it is in, in English. It almost sounds like a dinosaur in English here. Um, but I just want to want to go ahead and say that this is most likely going to be a, uh, a royal title, and um, so because there's there's actually many Xerxes in the Persian Empire. And so Joyce Baldwin will simply say that um, Xerxes may be an ancient Achaemenian royal title. Right. And so if we're trying to determine which Darius this is or what Xerxes this is, well, it could be it could be several. But in, it says in the first year by descent, a Mede who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans in the first year of his reign. Most likely, this is actually going to be pointing to the first year of the Persian Empire. So you're thinking again, 539 B.C. And um you know, this actually also then tags into, like, Daniel chapter 6. Um, it says Darius in, in Daniel chapter 5, verse 30. And let me just pull that up for us on the screen here. Daniel chapter 5, verse 30. It says, That very night Belshazzar, the Chaldean king, was killed, and Darius the Mede received the kingdom, being about 62 years old, and it pleased Darius. Right. Well, then at the end of Daniel chapter 6, which is going to be verse 28, what do you see? It says, so this Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. Um, and we remember backwards when we talked about this, that this and is, is very much so operates in the way of saying... Um, and let me just look up my note from Joyce Baldwin here, page 31. She says... Um, uh, it, the Darius is most likely a a, co a, a common uh, a double name, and and so this word and operates in, in such a way as saying Darius, um, who is called Cyrus, right? Let me see here, the end of Daniel chapter six. I'm sorry, Bal Joyce Baldwin on page 146, and, as in Daniel 7, 1, has the force of namely, or that is, being used explicatively, meaning in a, in a way to explain. And so there's two names belonging to the same person, Darius and Cyrus the Persian. And so then when we come back here to Daniel chapter 9, we're still thinking of that same king. Uh, which is why we can date it the way we do. So Daniel chapter 9, verse 1, in the year of Darius, um, the son of Xerxes, by descent a Mede, right? And so um, this is then going to be the the Cyrus who, who is in question here, okay? So in the first year of Darius, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, perceived in the books the number of years that, according to the word of the Lord to Jeremiah the prophet, must pass before the end of the desolations of Jerusalem, namely 70 years. 
Now, when we're, when we're thinking about some of these things here, the first thing to note is here that, that Daniel is talking about in the books, right? This is, the, the Old Testament is not in canon form yet. The Old Testament is not limited to just the books that we have today. The canon was still taking shape, was still becoming what we would now refer to as the Old Testament in 539 BC when Daniel is writing this down, or or at least when he's writing it down at the end of his life or whenever it was. So the, the Old Testament canyon is still taking shape, and yet there are still a, a set of authoritative books, a scripture, that can be referred back to even in Daniel's time. And this is something crucial for us to know and understand that any true prophet of God or anyone who even claims to be speaking about God or to God are people who should be, number one, referring back to Scripture, and number two, who, who are just who are soaked in Scripture. And that's, that's one of the primary ways to tell if, if, if somebody is speaking for God or not. And in the Old Testament, that was one of the ways in which people understood that somebody was a prophet or not, is if what they were saying was aligned in the books. And here we have Daniel, who is studying these scrolls. Right now, remember, Jeremiah's scroll was probably written down, oh, I mean, by probably 590 BC, okay? Or it would even have to be later than that, probably by, you know, 570 BC, right? So you, you, you would think that this is something that is being collected and taken down diligently, transported into exile, right? Remember, Jeremiah was the prophet um, prophesying the exile, that this is something that's then transferred down, and that, that Daniel is able to look at and even study this book, right? So perceived in the books, right? There's plural. And so other books would, of course, maybe be like something like Isaiah or, um, you know, definitely earlier on, it would be the Psalms and the historical, some of the historical books, and especially the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And he's taking and he's looking at all of these things, and he's studying them, and he's studying Jeremiah, right? And so what is he actually referring to here? Um, well, let's take a look here, for example, at Jeremiah chapter 25, verse 11. Um, and we'll go there, Jeremiah 25, verse 11. Um, this whole land, here, here it is, it's, it's right here on the screen for you if you couldn't find it quickly. This whole land shall become a ruin and a waste, and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon seventy years. Then after the seventy years are completed, I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, the land of the Chaldeans, for, for their iniquity, declares the Lord, making the land an everlasting waste. I will bring upon that land all the words that have uttered against it, everything written in the book which Jeremiah prophesied against all the nations. For many nations and great kings shall make slaves even of them, and I will recompense them according to their deeds and the work of their hands. Um, now this is not necessarily a, a study of Jeremiah, but everything written in this book which Jeremiah prophesied against the nations, remember that at one point in the book of Jeremiah, he actually writes all of his prophecies down for the king, that those prophecies are then given to the king of Judah. The king of Judah, as he hears it read, cuts things off with his penknife, throws them into the fire, and then Jeremiah has to write another book of the same prophecies, and he includes even more prophecies and, and more judgments in them. Um, and so uh, that's most likely what's being talked about here in Jeremiah. The key thing for us when we're thinking about the book of Daniel, is the idea of these 70 years. These 70 years are going to be something that, that are, are pretty, um, pretty important as we go on. And Daniel, and another place here then is going to be, I think, Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 10. So we'll go there very quickly. 
Jeremiah 29, 10. For thus says the Lord, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you and I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. Right? So right there, then we also have, you know, as Daniel's studying it, he's perceiving and he's reading this as something that's very literal. It's, it, it's right there. 70 years of Babylon are completed. I will visit you and I will fulfill to you my promise. Bring you back to this place. Okay, so this is something that is pretty key. This is something pretty key to understand as well. I mean, what Daniel is looking at is right here for us. Then notice that one of the most famous verses drawn upon by lots of different people is talked about. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord. And I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations, all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord. And I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. Um, these, these are really key and especially here this verse 11 is is of particular importance so many people quote this and like take it as a life verse and it's not necessarily bad to take it as a life verse um you know it it, it has some 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 resonances of things like romans 8 um for all things work together for good for those who love God who are called according to his purpose and that sort of thing where we, where we get the, the sense that God is going to be working out our lives for his plan for good if we love him. Um, and, and so it's not necessarily bad to take Jeremiah 29.11 as like a, a life verse or something. But the thing is, in context, it's very clearly speaking about the ancient Israelites specifically the ancient Judahites who are in exile and are now being brought back to the promised land. Okay? And so that's the 70 years again right there in Jeremiah. So Daniel is 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 reading Jeremiah. He's seeing these verses. He's understanding and comprehending what they mean. The time is fulfilled because Babylon is now over Throwed. So the so the time is now completed for Babylon, and and Daniel is now looking for the next step. Daniel is looking for God to call his people back from exile. All right, and so that's really what his prayer is going to be about, and where he's going to go. Now, just remember, if you have questions, please feel free to write them down, give me a text message, and then I'll know to tackle those questions in the next video. Um, so you write them down, you can then turn them into me or give a text message. Be happy to answer any questions. Don't forget to write down your questions as you go. By the end of the, the lecture, you may not remember them. So back again, we're coming back um, to Daniel. Now is a good time to pause the Dan the video, and we'll probably need somebody to read Daniel chapter 9, verses 3, all the way down to 15. That's the next chunk that we'll work on, so let's pause the video, have um, maybe two people read, maybe Daniel chapter 9, verses 3 through 9, and then a second person read verses 10 through through 15 again uh, and it'll appear on the screen in front of you if you could pause the video and read thank you so much so again the the expectation of daniel is now that the time of babylon has been completed god would be calling his people back from exile in Babylon and, and really all over, but especially in Babylon to Jerusalem. And so that's what, what he's going to do. He says, then I turn my face to the Lord God, seeking him by prayer and pleas for mercy with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. 
Um, this this kind of aligns with what we've been going over in Habakkuk. You know, Lord Jesus or, or Lord God, in the midst of your judgment, remember mercy. Or in the midst of your wrath, remember mercy, right? And so Daniel is now crying out to the Lord with prayer and pleas for mercy with fasting and sackcloth and ashes in order to receive a response for the Lord, for the Lord to do what he promised. Um, This is sackcloth and ashes is something that represents utter sorrow, right? So sackcloth and ashes represents utter sorrow. I mean, it's, it's it's, it's a posture of complete repentance, Sackcloth of, is, of course, very, very rough material and scratchy material. It's not pleasant to wear. And so every shift and every move and every itch is reminding the wearer of their sorrow, reminding them of their pain, reminding them of their anguish before God. Um, and, of course, fasting then, uh, very important. But here it's also important for a means of praying to God uh, for mercy they're making a, he's making a personal sacrifice with his body he's refusing to eat at least food okay here it would be refusing to eat at least food um, and and doing so in order to um, beg for mercy from the Lord right fasting does not do any like strong arming of the Lord. It doesn't manipulate the Lord into doing anything. Um, but fasting is a, is a way of making a personal sacrifice to God to let let Him know the sincerity. Let Him know um, the anguish. Let Him know the desire for um, their their prayer. And of course, please for mercy is. Is just the natural state of everyone who follows the God of Israel, of every Christian, right? We, we don't have any basis or any place before God to beg for anything other than mercy, right? The only place that we have before God is something that God himself created for us through Jesus Christ, right? We stand in in grace, because of grace, by grace, um, you know, and so th- this is something that, that that the Lord God has totally taken care of for us today to be able to to beg for mercy, um, beg for mercy for ourselves and our own lives, beg for mercy for others, and this is really the heart of one of the hearts of prayer. You know, when we're thinking about today, when we think about prayer, we should be thinking about several things. Number one, we should be thinking about praising God. And and that dovetails closely then to thanking God, right? So we praise God for his wonderful attributes and his love. We praise him for the great and mighty deliverances that he has given us. That's an essential part of prayer. Um, and it's an essential part of prayer for for us to glorify God by and also it's a good reminder for us every time we pray of just who we're coming before right so prayer is a praise and then the second thing that prayer is is of course thanksgiving we're rejoicing we give thanks we're 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 pouring out our gratitude to God for all that he has done for us so far and here's the thing with with whatever God has done for us he doesn't have to do anything else for us, and we would still be greatly in his debt. In fact, if all he did was call, if all he did was give us life, we are automatically in debt to him for every breath that we take. Right? I mean, we're so far in debt to God for everything that he has done for us that it's almost unfathomable. And so thanksgiving is, of course, a great posture of what we do in prayer. And the third thing is we plead for, is we, we plead for mercy. Every time we make a prayer request, whether it's for safe travels or whether it's for somebody's health or whether it's for somebody's um, safety, we, we are praying, um, we are pleading for mercy. And that's what we're doing. We're pleading for mercy. 
So we plead for mercy, and that's one of the critical and crucial parts of prayer, and, and understanding that all our prayer requests are actually pleas for mercy. Lord God, have mercy, right? And um, what we're going to see throughout the prayer is that the plea for mercy from Daniel's perspective is actually a plea for mercy really for the forgiveness of sin, and for God to carry through on the promises that he gave to the people of Israel. And so that's that's um, what we're going to be seeing then as we continue to look at this text. And so you notice in verse 4, I prayed to the Lord my God and made confession, saying... It's fascinating that Daniel makes confession. And so we should um, think about what this word means here. Um, confession covers the great things that God has done or wrong things we have done. right? And so that's really what, what the confession of Daniel is going to be covering. The great things that God has done and then the wrong things that we have done or that at least the people of judah at that time when we use we it's the people of judah and the forefathers at that time have done and so you know that's also again a model for us in prayer we too need to thank god rejoice in god for the great things he has done and confess our wrongdoing um, and plead for mercy and so that's a little bit about the prayer let's dive in here then um, daniel begins O Lord, the great and awesome God, who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments. Um, this, this is entirely appropriate and totally true. You know, God by his very nature is great and awesome. Um, that, that's who he is. And, and awesome here is not used in kind of the... the lingo of society for today when we say awesome you know like I, I use awesome if somebody gets a piece of pizza i'm like yeah that's awesome i love pizza too and oh you're you're just awesome and and what we mean is like that's cool or that's great or that's grand but awesome here is being used in the fullest sense of the definition it means it's all in spirit inspiring right i mean it, it's it's majestic it's grand uh, there's such grandeur and splendor to it it's awesome it's mighty and powerful and um that's that's the way awesome is then being used so then when it's applied to god it means that he is grand and and splendid and has splendor and majesty and is is simply incredible and, and awe-inspiring right so that's that's how the word is is being used there and he keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments now here's the question for you what's a covenant what's a covenant now a covenant is going to be and let me see if i have a handy definition here Um, I do not. Oh, okay. A covenant. Um, I don't have. I don't have my definition of covenant written down there. But a covenant is simply going to be, in the way we think of it, it's almost like a a legal contract between two parties. And and what this text is saying is that when God enters into a promise or a covenant with another, God keeps his end of the bargain, right? And so when we, when we think about, for example, the book of Deuteronomy, um, and we'll, let's see if I can click off here. When we think about the example of Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy is very much a covenantal book. It's a book of the covenants, all right? It describes um, all that Israel is to do, and then it describes what God will do. If 
if they keep their side, if Israel keeps their side of the covenant, then God will bless them and bless them and keep them and keep them. And if they break their side of the covenant, then here's exactly what God will do. And it lays out the judgments. And so when, when it says that God keeps covenant, he, Daniel is saying that he's trustworthy. He keeps his end of the bargain exactly as he said. He does what he says he will do. And steadfast love here. Um, is going to be uh, the ESV's way of translating the word chesed. Chesed, of course, is is a very common word in the Old Testament. Sometimes translated steadfast love, other times um, translated mercy, sometimes loving and mer- love and mercy, all of those sorts of things. But um, something that chesed is missed from the meaning of chesed is chesed is, is very much a covenantal word. Right? It means steadfast love and loyalty within covenant relationship. Right? So when we're talking about the Lord's steadfast love there, it with with Chesed, it binds right back into covenant, into keeping covenant. And it, it describes God's character within keeping covenant, that he is full of steadfast love that he that it's it's a pure love it's a continual love it's an ongoing love it's a love that is maintained and will not go away right so keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments and and so right here we we again have this sense of um God's loyalty within covenantal relationship. And what does that mean for the other party in the covenant? Well, the other party in the covenant needs to love him and keep his commandments. right? And, and love there is so much more than just emotion. Although, of course, there's going to be times of emotion towards God. Right, we we can't escape that element of emotion. You know, if we if we said that we loved our spouse or we loved our family, and yet we never ever felt emotion towards them, then they would begin to doubt their the love. Right, especially when if somebody gets really really passionate about like a sports game or something. Right, and so so love is a crucial element, um, and there should be emotion behind love. But we then also know that emotion is. Is something that kind of turns on and off. There are periods of emotion with love, and there are periods of emotion without love, right? Or, right? Or, well, I should. I'm sorry. There, there's periods of love with and without emotion, is what I should be saying. There are periods of love with and without emotion, and so love then is again that that desire for God's good for another. Right. And so when we love God, it's it's the desire for God's good for God. It means to to want his glory and to desire his glory and and want to do what is pleasing to him. And therefore, it's also a love that looks to keep his commandments. Right now, our mind, when we when we think about the word commandments in, in our mind, commandments are going to be like things like the Ten Commandments Um it can be also things like um, all, all 613, I think there's 613, 613 laws within the Pentateuch and within the Old Testament, specifically laws, you know, around kosher laws, right, food laws. There's also all sorts of laws in regards to um, what not to do and what to do. And, and so th- those are really what are being specified here, although if we were to look at the spirit of the law, and we're going to talk about this just a little bit, the spirit of the law, of course, goes beyond the written letter, right? It is not merely enough to not commit adultery, right? That does not a marriage make. It's like, well, yeah, I'm glad that in your marriage you didn't commit adultery. That's really good, but that doesn't mean that any that somebody's righteous within their marriage. It doesn't mean that they're actually doing what is right within the marriage just because they kept away from adultery. And so when, when we're thinking about loving God and, and keeping his commandments, there is this expectation even in the Old Testament that people would not just not do what God says don't do, but that there is a movement into doing well, 
within the law, right? Like if you're at a marriage, if you're married, then you live well within that marriage. Don't just not commit adultery, right? Like that's a good first step, but that's not at all what a marriage makes. And so um, this is a, a crucial idea. And this is how God acts and responds to those who love him and keep his commandments. Now, one other thing that I want to just go over with this word commandments. Something important for us to realize is that when God gives a command, he expects it to be obeyed. Right? Like he's not giving a good idea or a good suggestion. Oh, this is a great suggestion for you. You know, um, and many times, you know, if you come and talk with me or go talk with other pastors, all they might say is, well, here's a suggestion for what to do in the situation. Because humanly speaking, that's all we really can give unless we're, we're specifically saying this from the Bible, right? Now, if it's specifically this from the Bible, then that becomes a command, right? Like, do this or don't do this. And, and it's an, there's an expectation there for it to be obeyed. Now, I do want to um, move then um, from that into to talking a little bit then about today, right? And so we definitely want to get to this point. Um, here we go, John. Oh, let's start in John 14. Um, in John 14, he says this. Oh, look at that. Already highlighted it for me. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Fascinating that Within the New Testament, the idea of covenant is still very prevalent. Um, and this covenant is one of total grace. And, and so how this works is that God has God the Father has given us the ultimate gift in Jesus Christ, right? Has given us the ultimate gift in his sacrifice on the cross to make atonement for our sin and in the resurrection, the defeat of death, the defeat of all of Christ's enemies, right? And his rising from the dead to pave the way for eternal life. He is then king, okay? He was king, he is king, he will be king forevermore, right? So he's king of kings and lord of lords. And so um, that, that that's Part of it, but then God has given us a second gift, which is his very person, right? So he's given himself in Jesus Christ, and he continues to mediate that presence and relationship of Jesus Christ through his precious Holy Spirit to us, right? And, and these, are, these are gifts that can't be repaid. These are gifts that can't be earned. There's nothing we can do to earn the gift, right? There's nothing we can do to, uh, you know, twist God's arm to give the gift. There's nothing that we can do to uh, repay the gift. And, and so we're just, we're just utterly in God's mercy. We're utterly in his grace in this part of the covenant. And yet then we say, all right, I, I love you because you have first loved me now what can I do to please you, right? There's no, there's no earning in, in the Christian life. There, there's not even a desire for a reward or the desiring re reward in God, uh, meaning more of God or more of his presence is, is fine. Um, at least I think C.S. Lewis would say it's fine. You know, we, we desire to have a reward. But ultimately, it's just because God has loved me, what could I do other than love him back? Um, and, and we, we need to go to two different directions here at the same time. And so I want to go one direction and the next. This is what's so troubling about marginal Christians who say they believe in Jesus Christ and yet never spend any time with him, never open their Bibles, never go to church, or never bother to, 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 to actually be intentional about loving God back. It, it's kind of like, well, did you really receive the gift? Because if you received such a gift, you'd, you'd, you'd like say more than just thank you. You'd want to give your whole life to God just because you want to please him so desperately, right? Because there's all, there's all this love because God has first loved us. And, and, and so it's really, really troubling then when we see marginal Christians kind of on the outside of things, not, not 
not even desiring to be in God's presence, right? Not desiring to do devotions and be with him in the word and to study his word and not, not to give all that they can give in their lives, right? Now, of course, there's a difference between how much a minister can give, how much a retired person can give, and how much somebody who's working 80 hours a week or 60 hours a week can give. But the desire, the desire is still there to dig into the Word. The desire is still there to be with God. And there, there's a, a, a purposeful making of time to go and be with them in church and be with other Christians and people of God and to fellowship with them and, and just rejoice with them. There's a desire to do things that are good in order to please the Lord and, and to to be somebody who pleases the Lord, right? And it, this is the secret then, and it's not really a secret because Jesus tells us, but it's the secret to growing as a disciple of Christ. And here it is. If you love me, this is not a guilt trip. Jesus is not trying to guilt trip anyone into doing anything. This is the method. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Love Jesus with everything we have, and we will find him empowering us to keep his commandments. We will find him working his will and in us what is pleasing in his sight to bring us to completion. We will find our reliance on him to do his good and pleasing work that we might keep his commandments. And that's exactly where he goes. And I will ask the Father... And he will give you another helper to be with you forever. Not just now, but for all time you will have the Holy Spirit forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. Right. So th this promise of, if you love me, you will keep my commandments is intimately linked to the giving of the helper, to giving the giving of the Holy Spirit. Okay, turn with me then very quickly also to John 15, right? If you haven't memorized the first 10 or 15 verses of John 15, it's a great project to work on. Here it is. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Right? So when we're, when we're thinking about covenant, we're thinking about specifically the Christian life which we live. One of the, one of the and I would argue, the most central important thing that we can do in faith is spend time with God every single day to dwell with him in his word for long periods and for short periods throughout the day to, to read and memorize scripture so that we abide. Abide in Jesus so that we live in Jesus so that our whole so that we're connected to the vine that we naturally and easily bear fruit. Now it may not seem so natural and easy for us, but the Holy Spirit's power in us will, will just naturally give us the fruit that pleases God, that good fruit. Okay? And it comes from abiding in Him. And notice then that it's all about God being faithful in covenant relationship. God keeps covenant with steadfast love for those who love him and keep his commandments. Right? These two things are linked together. And in this powerful prayer of Daniel, we see that. Already, folks, I'm noticing the time. We're running about 45 minutes at this point. Thank you so very much. Um, we, I appreciate you attending. Please just start to discuss what you have heard here today. Ask any questions and maybe answer any of those questions. Then I hope to see you um, up in the sanctuary right after the serve, right after this. Thank you so very much. God bless.